<laughs> One of the things that we're very interested in, uh, of course, in academia, is better ways of being smart. After all, the whole academic system is a kind of attempt of dealing with this horrible problem that the world is so big and so complex. So, a typical academic solution is to try to simplify things. The problem is, of course, that, well, a lot of the problems we're facing across the world and in the near future turn out to be so complex that the traditional ways of simplifying them don't seem to work that well. In addition, life is also becoming increasingly complex. Our brains evolve to be able to hunt uh, uh, the prey and the gather uh, the foodstuffs of Africa and Savannah. They're not that good at handling statistics. They're very bad at risk evaluation, especially very low probability risks. They're very bad at handling complex interconnected systems, like the links between the geology of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and the transport network and what that does with the prices of fruit in my local store. So the problem is, as we're getting more and more powerful technology, we also find ourselves rather bewildered by the possibilities. You know, it's almost like we're getting disempowered by our new abilities. But in that case, I think there is a nice heuristic from Bradley Felton. Well, if we don't really know which track we should be choosing, we should at least try to become better at choosing things. So I'm going to try to talk a little bit about building better brains. And in this case, mainly upgrading our own brains. Although I'm a great fan of artificial intelligence, and I also think there are interesting ways of going post-humans by simply borrowing our neural architecture and copying it into machines, now I'm mainly going to be looking at the kind of near-term prospect of improving our intelligence. In general, I think we, have, we can try to organize it a little bit by looking at the internal and external possibilities, and the hardware and software. Uh, so internal things, that is the kind of interesting science fiction stuff that we're going to perhaps be focusing most on because it also has its glamour, as well as the transgression of course, we're changing human nature by putting some stuff inside our skin. We're in, uh, perhaps thinking about genetic modifications, drugs, or why not a link to a brain-computer interface. But equally of course, we're in, you making use of a ridiculous amount of external hardware some of it, like pen and paper, quite profoundly powerful in changing the way we think and perceive the world. Others, new and interesting, like little gadgets. And to some of it, probably having a much bigger effect than almost anything we can put inside our brains. Equally powerful is software. The information we get from other people, the ways we're using to organize our way of thinking, that has a profound effect uh, on our. Uh, how we see the world and what we can solve. And we can also put some of that uh, software outside. It doesn't have to be physical software running a computer. Quite a lot of important software is running in societies. It's the routines and the connections we have. It's the institutions we have set up. And these can also be enormously powerful. So, among the different kinds of uh, cognitive enhancement, here is a very traditional form that most people don't even recognize very much as cognition enhancement, education which is quite odd actually. This system of having an old wise guy standing in front of other people and uh, telling them how it is, it's going back very much to the medieval uh, system. Well, in Oxford of course the difference is practically zero. We're still doing things for good old ways. Uh, but, well, clearly it must be somewhat good because as a society, practically all modern society have decided that this is so good it's mandatory. If a child says, no, I don't want to learn how to read and write, we force them to learn it. It's so good for them that they're not allowed to stay away from this enhancement. There is a lot of interesting ethics actually about, well, how can we even motivate this? But to a large degree, the idea of education is that it's supposed to make us better people. Not just more moral, but at least, not just more knowledgeable, but also better able at solving problems. And actually, it turns out that we get about 2.7 IQ points per year of schooling, up to some limit. Otherwise, a lot of the old academics of Oxford would be much smarter. And uh, so, clearly, it's helping us to a large degree. It turns out that uh, having an education helps you solve various kinds of problems. Not just because you know how to solve a particular kind of problem, because you get, but also because you get more used to problem solving. There are downsides. One is it's ter terribly expensive. Because it's based, of course, on the salaries of the teachers and professors. Yet, as a society, we think it's so good that we make it mandatory and we're making sure that there is enormous funding for it. 
There is never enough funding, of course, but we are still struggling to make this uh, work. So one interesting thing, when uh, you mentally encounter uh, some uh, form of enhancement that you think, well, this might be scary or might increase in quality, is to think, well, would we be wanting to treat it like school? Would we say, this is so good, we actually should make it uh, mandatory or at least uh, pay for it with taxpayer money? In general, there are also other forms of education. There are various traditional forms of mental training, ranging from meditation to the visualization of the sport, that also serves reorganizing the brain. Because what is happening in the students when they're listening to the lecture is, of course, that this neural network out somewhere up in the cortex hopefully gets reorganized. And I think this is a very important realization that our minds are very much a physical object and can get affected not just by information but also what we do physically to them. So here is one of my favorite graphs which I love to show and unfortunately I don't live by it. So this shows uh, from a nature paper uh, about aerobic uh, capacity and uh, the mathematics uh, scores and re reading ability scores on test subjects. And it shows that, well, better aerobic capacity seems to actually improve uh, cognition. At least have no aerobic capacity, that's bad for your thinking. Improving your general health by eating healthy food, avoiding getting sick, especially getting sick when young, avoiding uh, getting iodine deficiency and a lot of other things can really improve the brain. This is unsurprising, of course. Uh, yet, it also shows that, well, sometimes we can tweak things just by modifying our bodies. Uh, of course, this uh, is also interesting because it's not training our special skits. If I'm running around in the gym, I'm not learning anything in particular, but yet my uh, reading ability apparently goes up. The really interesting thing is, of course, once we uh, do try to affect this directly, uh, I'm a lazy person. Although I'm showing that slide all the time, I still not go to the gym. <laughs> because uh, I, I can even give a nice evolutionary argument for why my brain is motivated not to waste too much energy when I can uh, be lazy. Uh, but intellectually, I'm having a hard time getting around it. So if there was a pill that gave me a well-trained body, I would immediately take it. And similar, of course, we might want to cheat a bit also by modifying the brain. So cognition-enhancing drugs are interesting because they exist here and now. We have pretty decent data on it, although I would be much happier if we had much better data. And uh, they're also in use. And some of them are not even recognized as drugs. This morning, I think most of you have asked yourself about drinking a drink containing caffeine. And of course, uh, we have the sugar also that was added. Sugar is in many ways my favorite cognitive enhancer. It's safe, it's legal. We have a lot of good data on how it improves cognition up to a point. Don't take too much and it goes down again. Um, and in general, the side effects are pretty well documented. And I think most of us find them pretty bearable. But we also have enhancers like nicotine and alcohol, which also have some side effects which are quite serious. But they also seem to be quite useful in certain circumstances. These ones are classical enhancers, and most people don't even recognize them as enhancers. They think of them as food, or drink, or maybe just as a bad drug that one shouldn't be taking. But we have a lot of drugs that go straight into the realm of brain systems that affect learning and attention, like amphetamine. We have Ritalin, methylphenidate, which is uh, acting on the dopaminergic system in the frontal lobe, and is having an interesting effect on attention. Very useful if you've got ADHD, and to some extent useful, it seems, in healthy people. Um, and this, of course, brings up an interesting problem. These drugs were developed to treat various illnesses, but they can help healthy people. And this is, of course, what keeping us people in bioethics, uh, getting our salaries, because now people are debating whether this is ethical or not to use. There is actually quite a lot of drugs developed for Alzheimer's that seem to have been used for memory enhancing effects. And uh, there is various things waiting in the wings and various clinical trials that seem to be using what we're now learning about how memory is stored in the brain to really improve memory, like CREP inhibitors and amplicides. Some of these ones are definitely going to have risks. In uh, philosophy it's very nice to say, well, let's assume these drugs have no side effects whatsoever, would it be ethical to take them? In practice, of course, all drugs do have side effects, and we also have a lot of individual variations. Different uh, people have different levels of liver enzymes, which are going to break drugs down these drugs at different rates, which means that the dosage that might affect me to a useful level might be an overdose or an underdose for other people. And some people also notice that, well, actually, taking Ritalin to focus your attention, that's great if you want to focus attention. 